Thank you. And thank you to Marine Money for hosting today's virtual event on ship finance and decarbonization. It's a pleasure to be part of it. I have the honor of interviewing Lars Erik Markusen from Heidelberg Cement on this first session on rewarding and protecting first movers in decarbonization to discuss about their initiative for a zero emission dry bulk vessel. Lars Erik is chartering manager for bulk vessels in Heidelberg Cement, North Europe. So Lars Erik, to start with, please can you tell us more about this very exciting project and the background for initiating it? Yes, uh, happy to. Um, together with the Norwegian grain producer, Felleschöpe, we found out that if we can combine our eastbound volumes from the west coast of Norway into Oslo and theirs going the other way, we could actually utilize a vessel on a round trip basis in such a way that we should be able to take the leap into new emission free technology. So what we're doing is we're asking someone to build a predominantly hydrogen powered emission free bulk vessel of around 5000 deadweight tons. And if they do that, we're prepared to do a 15 year time charter. So this is part of the Norwegian uh, green shipping program. And it's through this pretty unique cooperation between ship owners and charters like ourselves that we are able to do this kind of long-term leap into something quite unknown. Hmm. And how did you market the project to the ship owners? Well, Quite a few of the ship owners involved now uh, have been part of the uh, green shipping program from before, but we also did go out quite broadly in July. Uh, we actually got support from the uh, Norwegian Minister of uh, the Environment to go out and launch this, and we did a request for interest where we asked uh, the international shipping community who could be interested in doing this, who in actually bidding for this, uh, this contract. We thought that maybe we'd get five or six answers. We got 31. So uh, it seems we uh, we hit the timing pretty right. Uh, and uh, what we did is we went out and we uh, we talked to quite a few ship owners in the weeks and months beforehand, and we uh, sent it out as you would send out uh, any normal request for a quotation. So uh, we're now in the deciding stages, and during March we should be. Uh, ready to select the ship owner that will be developing the ship together with us. That's great. And uh, what do you think attracted the number of bidders for the project? Um, I think I think it's quite a few things. Uh, one, of course, is it's, it's easy to get responses to a 15 year time charter. Building a 15 year time charter attracts a lot of uh, positive attention. And I think it's absolutely necessary to have that long term view. Um, also, we timed it probably quite well in the COVID-19 year. Uh, there were quite a few uh, ship designers available. There were quite a few consultants who had times on, time on their hands. Uh, but I think also this is a relatively short voyage. We're talking about three to 400 nautical miles each way. The vessel is only about 5,000 deadweight tons or 100 meter length. Uh, and it's, it's possible as kind of a first step we're not talking here about building a deep sea vessel of, uh, of you know, several hundred thousand tons. It's, it's relatively small. Uh, it could be the perfect testing ground for, uh, for quite a few international shipping companies. So we've got interests from big deep sea operators as well as the local niche operators. And of course, it helps that we're doing this in Norway where hydrogen uh, production is a little bit cheaper due to uh, hydroelectric power and where we have quite a big uh, possibility of attracting state funding from, uh, for example, Enova. Hmm. Uh, can you share with us some insight on the various concepts and technologies being proposed for the project? Sure. Uh, we went out first and said this vessel has to be zero emission and we didn't we didn't start out by saying it has to be hydrogen. We said zero emissions. So we ruled out biofuels. They are carbon neutral, but they still make or still produce CO2. Um, and then we said the vessel has to be at least 500 nautical mile range, and it has to be self-discharging. Beyond that, it was up to uh, ammonia, 
uh, LOHC or liquid hydrogen or battery powered or compressed hydrogen. And we actually have offers on all those five forms of, of hydrogen molecules. So the energy storage system on board has been actually not decided yet. It looks at the moment like we're going to land on compressed hydrogen. But uh, up until the last couple of weeks, we've still been talking about uh, ammonia and liquid nitrogen as well. Uh, sorry, liquid hydrogen as well. Uh, it also, we have offers for vessels using uh, fuel cells and vessels using combustion engines. And they're actually neck and neck when it comes to uh, the economy. And uh, we, we're, still, we're still considering quite a few options. And of course, storing the hydrogen on board, we probably need around 5,000 kilos of pure hydrogen on board. Um, that takes a lot of space and it, it's, it's you know, quite a few 20 or 40 foot uh, compressed containers. Uh, so we're talking probably eight to 10 containers on board to store this. And it's that logistics of how we actually get the fuel on board the ship is, is one of the big headaches right now. That's very interesting. Um, how important is it that the solutions are scalable and can be used for other vessels in the coming years? Oh, it's absolutely crucial. Um, what we want to avoid, and we don't want to build a unicorn. We don't want to build a one single ship that will never be seen again. What we're starting, what we're hoping to start is a fleet renewal, at least in the North Atlantic, Norwegian coastal waters. Uh, there are quite a few hundred ships that are getting quite old. And we hope that this will be the first of many. Um, I think that the scalability, if you can build a 5,000 tonner that can sail 500 nautical miles, you can probably build a 50,000 tonner, maybe with slightly different energy uh, consumption or slightly different uh, propulsion. But that's the whole point, is to show that the technology works and the energy mode we choose can actually be scaled up uh, at a later stage. And even if you don't end up with Panamax vessels running on compressed hydrogen, maybe they'll run on uh, ammonia or uh, maybe they'll run on you know, liquid hydrogen. Maybe they won't be running on uh, fuel cells, but they'll be running on, uh, on uh, combustion engines. We'll, we'll see that as time goes forward. But I think that right now, uh, not necessarily scaling up to bigger vessels, but rolling it out into many more vessels of the same size of around uh, 5,000 tons is definitely uh, our goal. That's great and, and of course important to uh, drive the developments in this area uh, that it's scalable on, on other and can be used on other vessels. We actually already see that a Norwegian a third Norwegian uh, cargo owner, Videk, who uh, makes asphalt, they have already come out in January, almost copying our concept, saying that they want to build two 3,000 tonners that will transport uh, asphalt and asphalt aggregates. Um, and uh, we also know that there are quite a few other uh, cargo owners that are in talks uh, with some of the shipping companies that we're in talks with. Uh, maybe the ones that participate in our project will also end up building two or three ships instead of just one. That's very interesting. Many charters uh, want the greener ships, but uh, they won't necessarily. Uh, they don't necessarily want to pay more. Can you uh, say a bit about the financial impact for you this project? Yeah. Uh, well, I can easily say that we really don't want to pay that much more either. We're not doing this out of the goodness of our hearts. We're doing it because we see from our business models and from our business case that we've worked quite hard on. Uh, this is going to make sense, economically speaking. We know that the cost of driving uh, or using uh, diesel-powered ships is going to increase, both in terms of diesel costs going up, but also in terms of national or international fees being levied on, on carbon, carbon taxes, for example. So for us, we actually see that after maybe only a year of, uh, of operations, we'll be on par with diesel, uh, expected diesel prices. Um, and again, it's the combination of utilizing the vessel, thinking more in terms of cooperation and open book than in uh, the traditional very kind of competitive shipping environment that we're used to. 
we're co we are cooperating with a grain company and grain and sand don't mix. I mean, we, we don't have any other contact points. We're only utilizing this vessel and we're doing it on an open book method together with a shipping company on an open book method. And I think it's, it's that uh, different way of thinking about the cooperation that is going to make this happen long term. Yeah, and, and thanks for sharing uh, your thinking on, on that. Uh, this project is uh, a collaboration between uh, various stakeholders. Uh, you have yourself and Fellowship Agri as customers. You have the shipping company, you have the fuel provider. There will be financing. Uh, you have gotten grants from uh, the government uh, and you are also part of the green shipping program. Mm. How important do you think it is to establish these types of collaborations in order to initiate projects that will drive the transition to zero emission? I think it's absolutely necessary because what we're doing here is something new um, and the technology is something new and, and the way of thinking and financing it is, is going to be quite new. Uh, I don't think we would be able to do this if we weren't members of the green shipping program because we wouldn't have any reason to collaborate with the green shipping company um, and we wouldn't have access to the network uh, within that kind of uh, program. I also think that, again, we need to, if we're going to do something new, we probably have to cooperate in a new way. One of the reasons we have such an aging fleet of coastal vessels in Norway is that it's been a race to the bottom in terms of time charter rates and COA rates. We've all been trying to save 50 cents here or five kroner there year after year after year, and the margins are just dropping to the extent where the ship owners are like, We've had enough. We can't make any money out of this. We, this is not sustainable. And in order for shipping to be environmentally sustainable, it has to be financially sustainable. And that is that means we need to cooperate in a different way. And getting the Norwegian authorities on board is also important for us as a cement company. I mean, a lot of what we produce in cement goes into making national infrastructure. So it actually also starts with the large entrepreneurs and the people who are building stuff who actually start to question, can the cement we purchase be transported in a better way? So it's actually the customers behind the uh, ship, uh, the, behind the charters who actually have a role in this as well. A very good example uh, for others. Any predictions for the future and the way forward to reach the zero emission uh, targets? Wow, that's a big question. Um, well, I think this is one of them. I think trans uh, kind of a going towards not or emission free transport on a local scale makes is a lot easier than going deep sea at once. So I think that's that's one part. Uh, we're also seeing, as I mentioned, we had five different types of fuel ready to replace diesel or, or, or heavy fuel oil. Uh, and I think that in the future, we'll see ships powered by batteries, by hydrogen, by biofuels and so on, depending on their size and, and, and range. Uh, while today everyone uses diesel or everyone uses heavy fuel oil, I think we'll see a bigger multitude of, uh, of energy storage. Um, and I think, once again, it starts with the collaboration and it kind of becomes a win-win. So it looks like what was impossible a couple of years ago is going to be almost uh, the way of doing business in the future. So I think that th as things move faster uh, forward, the ability that financers Operators, owners, brokers, banks have to cooperate and utilize the, uh, the networks they have is, is going to be absolutely crucial to make this happen. Hmm. Well, thank you, Lars Erik, for uh, giving us insight on, uh, on this project. I look forward to uh, follow the project over the coming years and, uh, of course, see who will be the selected uh, shipping company and, uh, and fuel provider. And I'm sure the audience is excited about that as well. Thank you again to Marine Money for hosting uh, today's event with many interesting sessions on decarbonization. Thank you. Thanks.